So I'm James Fletcher. I'm the program director um, at the uh, Michigan State's program at Sparrow. I'm also a nephrologist as well as palliative care. So we're doing palliative considerations and the management of end-stage kidney disease. I have no financial disclosures. I'd love some. Um, hopefully what everybody will take away in bit is um, uh, the goal. You know, what's the average symptom burden for someone on dialysis? What are the prognostic factors involved in the discussion regarding dialysis? What are the system dynamics around dialysis care? What's the process involved in initiating and sustaining? And then um, what's the history of dialysis and how we got here? And e each one of these could be a lecture on their own. So I'm hope hoping that there isn't something that people felt like there's uh, left a little lacking or wish to hear more. And you can always email me and see if I know more on it. I'm, I'm happy to correspond. Um, <clears throat> I was just telling uh, John, just before we started, Dr. Mulder, um, that I started Palliative Fellowship in 2013. And my goal was I was going to be, be apostle of palliative back to the nephrology masses. And one of the um, grand, uh, nephrologists in in that area just asked, well, why are you going to go do that nursing home thing? And none of them could see the reason why and they're going around. But I, I could sort of see it because I felt like the symptom burden was just not getting addressed. So the end of my fellowship, I was talking to somebody who sort of considered the, the godfather of nephrology and, and palliative. And he said that he thought that there were 12 to 24 board certified physicians in nephrology and palliative care. And he wasn't even sure how many. He said one would pop up now and again. Then in 2020, I was told the number was approaching 50. And then we have at least three fellowships in the country with a combined nephrology and palliative care, and two of them are at Ivy League um, schools. So it, the, the recognition of palliative and nephrology is, is, is really coming to the forefront now. So I just did this in case somebody else was looking at these slides a little bit more introduction, but we all know what palliative does and all things. But this was the thing when I, when the idea of somebody saying, oh, you're doing that nursing home thing. It's like, well, no, palliative care does these things. Don't you want these things for your patients, such as a firm's life and re relief pain from distressing symptoms? And then, you know, offers a support system and things. So we all know these things. This is for, just for somebody who needs a little bit more of a background. Okay, so this, so just somebody's tr been trying to do nephrology or m managing urine or kidney disease for centuries. And this, I wouldn't even, um, Nicholas Eschbrook, who's a, a a historian of medicine just said it was only modern medicine that made it possible to delineate that all dying as a longer defined fa phase of life and therefore the work of hospice. And he said earlier times dying was either short, hardly predictable or brutal or, or long infirmity. Now I'm not talking about dying or even saying putting people into hospice now, but I think what he, what he helped delineate very well is, is that we have a huge population out there of people that have chronic illnesses that are living a longer time, <clears throat> even though we know what the trajectory is going to be. And this is a new thing for medicine, or it's a new paradigm um, of, of what we're doing. And, I, and I've seen it in my um, 20, oh, 20, nearly 30 years in medicine. I've seen how the complexity of patients has even increased as compared to when I started. Okay, so quick history, just where did dialysis come about? Um, so the, the 1920s, they did the first time they did a machine on somebody uh, or animals, and in theory it worked. Perineal dialysis, they did it in the 30s. It was a lady who was born with a single kidney, and it got obstructed with a stone, and they were able to, to get her through after they removed the stone. So they, they proved that it worked for root, acute renal. And then this is an interesting guy. So this is uh, Dr. Kolf. So he created the first machine, which worked in 1945, but he didn't expect it was going to be very helpful and practical. So he, the Germans came to him um, because he's in the Netherlands and the occupation. They said, hey, you're a smart guy. We want something to help the war effort. And he said, well, how about something that cleans the blood if your kidney's not working? And they said, oh, good. And it's like, oh, well, these guys are not with it. They don't realize that such a machine's impractical. Um, and he actually made it using sausage casings and orange juice cans to make the first one. And then it got a little bit better. He had about six or eight examples when the war ended, but he thought it was so impractical. He gave the examples, he gave um, over half of them to institutions in the United States because um, he just didn't think there's going to be any further value to it. And Colf actually came to the United States, but he's um, famous in other circles. He's one of the pioneers of the heart-lung bypass machine for heart surgery. Um, but anyway, so he thought his invention had actually been that he was snookering the Germans on something that was just going to be too impractical to work. So then, but people worked on it again. They got the idea of a glass shunt instead of 
surgically opening up the vessel every time to dialysis. Korean War sped it along, um, interest in it. And then the idea, well, then they had the first kidney transplant, and that really spurred dialysis because now it was like, well, if we can buy you time until you get a transplant, then there's a purpose in it, even if it can't last a long time. Um, Quentin, you know, what a, what a coincidence, and it's called a Quentin, um, had the artificial shunt. And then Dow was able to invent something instead of it being, you'll see a di old dialysis machine in a minute, that all of it could be done in a practical and disposable cartridge as, as compared to a huge machine. So that's, a, so that's an original dialysis machine, and it was a barrel, and this would roll around, and it would, would um, uh, move through and then physically clean the blood and put it on through. So that whole thing now has been replaced by a dialysis cartridge that's um, uh, about a foot long and maybe three inches in diameter, depending on who's it, that you're using. So this is the famous thing. So who shall live? This is a, from a TV show from CBS in the, in the early 60s and just discussing the, placing people on dialysis. And it went over the, the, the missions and policy committee of the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center. But it was sort of, they were nicknamed the death committee. And they determined the eligibility of the first of the people to use dialysis. Members on there were lay people. People were allowed to have secret membership. They would not reveal the members if they were afraid about community backlash. They considered things like patients' income and quote unquote what social worth is. I'm sure we would not use that anymore ethically. <laughs> and it's part of the idea, if everybody remembers Sarah Palin, she's sort of fallen out of the, the spotlight, but where she was talking about death committees, and these were referencing, but this was a committee that used to look at who would have the best um, chances of a success rate on the machine. And then also who was it that when they were getting dialysis would provide some of the better benefits back to society in their opinion. The cost at that time of dialysis was one and a half times that um, average annual income in the United States. It's not quite different depending on, on who you quote now as, as the average uh, annual income. Um, let's see. Uh, quick, so Congress in dialysis about 1972, they created the end stage legislation. I know it's now called end stage kidney disease, but in reference of how it was used at the time, I'll refer, uh, refer to certain things as end stage renal disease. So the end stage renal disease segment um, brought to the attention of Congress by a representative, most things had a family member on dialysis. We're not sure exactly who that is, though. It got, got lost a little bit. We suspect it was this, this one or two um, representatives. But they thought it was only going to apply to 11,000 people and it was only going to cost $135 million. And then they thought, well, maybe you'd have as many as 35 people um, and it would cost a billion dollars in 10 years from 1973. Well, they met the, the population. They met 35,000 in 1977, and they met a billion in 1978, so five years ahead of schedule. And then they thought the technology over time would drop costs, but they've actually found that's not the case. The average cost has actually risen. So one of the assumptions on this is that, well, we'll start it now for people, and then it'll, it'll, be getting, it'll get a lot cheaper for them in the future. Um, and then in the 1990s, they were starting to note that there's an exponential growth of older, sicker patients on dialysis, that it had morphed from a def um, uh, into a sort of a default option as compared to a treatment path that they're either doing it until somebody's kidney had recovered or they were doing it as a bridge to transplant. And the numbers are gone. So then about 2010, um, started to see it sort of to, to plateau off about the number of 75-year-olds being started on dialysis. So, um, you know, uh, estimate now in terms of 650,000 Americans are on some form of renal replacement, 2 million worldwide. So you, you can do the math on how many Americans are on as compared to the rest of the world. Um, but $90,000 a year um, cost for hemodialysis in center. I still haven't found a good reference for home dialysis um, average, but it's considered to be much cheaper than um, in center dialysis. Um, 54,000 for peritoneal and 33,000 to maintain someone on their renal transplant the, two years after they've gotten the transplant. Of course, the surgery and everything involved with the surgery that first year is, is very high. Um, incidence of, of ESRD or now is, is KD is about 5% per year. Need for transplant is at eight. And then it differs every year because the budget changes and all sorts of budget guidelines. But um, the SRD or ES KD patients are 1% of the Medicare population, but 7 to 8% of the Medicare expenditures. And there's a different way to do the math on that, um, where uh, because Medicare is a huge part of the federal budget and you, you take the math around, that you can say that roughly the dialysis 
a, a renal replacement therapy population is 1% of the entire federal budget, all federal budget, not healthcare budget. So national parks and aircraft carriers and um, uh, student loans and, 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 and such like that, that the entire federal budget, 1% of it is related to around kidney replacement therapy. Um, so, you know, this is a sick population. The five-year survival rate for incident dialysis patients is 40%, and that's 26% less than that of incident cancer patients. So there's a colleague I know who's um, a nephrologist but works at a cancer center, and he says that if you looked into a waiting room of, of sort of new cancer patients and you looked into the waiting room of new dialysis patients, in five years, there'd be fewer of those dialysis patients left in that waiting room again. So it gets underestimated um, how, how generally sick this population is. Um, the RPA, which is the Renal Physician Association and ASN, the American Society of Nephrology, they published joint guidelines that all patients going into dialysis care should have a palliative care consultation. And that also, when you're thinking about someone going on to dialysis that both organizations recommend that you should have a path already figured out for the patient to be able to go from the dialysis unit to hospice if they so choose or the or the circumstances would suggest that that that, um, that would be the wisest option um, they also recommend advanced care planning um, and uh, um, and every when you speak to dialysis patients they say that you should speak to them about what's their estimate of prognosis and shared about it initiation so going on they should have an idea that once they go on um, how long can they expect to be on dialysis or what would be their average expectancy and you'd be surprised they it gets discussed all the all the um, risks of going on dialysis such if you have a stroke or an air embolism which is never seen today with the computerized um, machines um, but it gets discussed a little bit less like, okay, well, this is the average expectancy of somebody on a dialysis machine when people are making their decisions. So um, this was from a John Oliver um, show. He has that show uh, on HBO um, last week tonight, but he did an episode sort of focusing on dialysis. And one of the things he said, we're paying for a Lamborghini and we're getting a drunk donkey on roller skates. Um, and he said, it's easier to find a doctor at a Taco Bell than it is in dialysis unit. And I know this from a correspondence from a, uh, a, another a colleague from an um, Italian Navy when I was in the U.S. Navy. I said, Italy, Malta, Austria, there's always a doctor present in the dialysis center. So the, the concept of like a freestanding, um, uh, they don't want to name a particular company, but freestanding dialysis center on, on the block down the street and that. You never the doctor only comes once a week to round on the patients. However, that doesn't happen. And the he said in Malta, if it's more than one patient getting dialysis, if there's two, there has to be a doctor present. So it's sort of the idea that that the 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 physician is there to head off any complications, or also just to see the patient. Um, there's also concern about is it where the profit motive may be and encouraging people to do um, dialysis in 1982. 60% of dialysis was at nonprofit centers or hospitals. And then in 2014, 69% uh, of dialysis was at for-profit freestanding centers. So could we be doing better? And when we're talking about palliative, but again, talk about prognosis or where this field may change if we put um, emphasis on it, just to sort of stray away a little bit from palliative, but the general dialysis population. One quarter of Americans who start dialysis will die within their first year. Only one out of nine Italians who start dialysis will die within the first will be in the first year. So, is it patient selection? Um, is it a socialized system that people are are able to get their other care taken care of? They have access to primary care, or is it having time to talk to the patients? But um, or do they just in these countries do they just say if you're if you're much sicker they they lean you towards saying I think you would probably do better with conservative management um, and supportive care until you go, but um, uh, much higher mortality for our patients of, 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 of what happens in their first year after di starting dialysis. Okay, so I think it, you could make an easy argument that there's poor preparation in dialysis in this country as compared to, to others. Um, most patients are discovered late or an active renal failure. Um, it adds a little bit to the cost because you have to put in acute dialysis access. You don't have time to put in a fistula or graft. Um, most are started on hemodialysis in this country. Um, a modality most patients then want to keep or and most nephrologists are more familiar with 
So peritoneal dialysis is most common in the world. Um, in New Zealand, it's 90% of their populations on peritoneal dialysis. Hong Kong, unless there's a medical reason, you have to be on hemodialysis. Everybody goes on peritoneal dialysis. There's no choice. Um, if you need dialysis and you can take it, you have to do peritoneal. Um, so poor head start as well for transplant evaluation. Um, non-scientific, but I just ask around. It takes about four months to get in to see a nephrologist. And then um, when Congress approved this in the early 70s, there was a thought if they were approving a lot of these measures, they actually thought we would have something a little bit more of a socialized system now in medicine. And then we sort of took a, um, for whatever reasons, a 180 degree turn from this in the mid 70s from how we looked at um, government support for medical care. So I always put this slide in. Um, I had a colleague did me a huge favor and he asked me, um, I could pay him back by putting in his slide. It's a little bit older now. But he just shows it's um, the, the nephrologist. So how many people um, got uh, uh, ESRD or ESKD counseling within a year more of, of um, starting dialysis or seeing it? But he liked this one over here, like how many had seen a dietitian? And one of his big crusades is getting proper dietary counsel can prolong somebody before they have to go on dialysis for a year or two. And then you think of the cost savings of one year of dialysis or two years of dialysis um, um, from that. So that's his crusade saying that that should be uh, much more available to people who are in that situation um, than what we're currently providing. So I always give, uh, I've always put this in as a thanks to him. Um, so we have no limits in this country about who can be offered dialysis. We don't have rationing. Um, uh, we, um, do we offer initiation much more than other countries? And then how do we feel about the people who are doing dialysis or how do we feel when it's referred? So this is a study 76 primary care physicians in West Virginia, 20 of them admitted um, to at least once per year of de facto not initiating dialysis. They didn't send them to a nephrologist because they thought the patient was not going to do well on dialysis, and they didn't want that doctor to start dialysis because they always start dialysis. So it was sort of showing that it was recognized in some of the primary care circles about which patients do or, or don't do well on dialysis, and this is how they sort of um, responded to it. Um, hospice delay, so JAMA found that only 20% of patients with um, ESRD, and again, put, as they put in the article, ESRD, used hospice before they died, and the percentage of those in less for three days was twice the average of other serious illnesses. And then um, longer hospice stays were associated with overall less utilization of Medicare re uh, resources. Of course, there's that rough rule of thumb. Some of you guys are... are um, much more knowledgeable in this than I am, but the idea about how many days do you have to be in hospice before the hospice breaks even, I, I was always told about six days, um, and that because of that short lead time, it may undercut what would be viewed as the potential savings of hospice, and then it may skew the numbers when you're reporting how hospice saves money if people get supportive care for their kidney disease. Uh, another one said um, that even after foregoing or stopping dialysis, 26% of the patients did not choose um, the article said, said, oh, well, if they didn't choose hospice, then it must have been a poor quality discussion. And I think for all of us who've been doing this for a while, um, the very best of us in having goals of care discussion, there are some patients that just will not go on hospice. And I, showed, I, I felt that was an ignorance of the author, that they weren't in this field, if they just thought that um, the, anyone who choo chooses not to do hospice, it just obviously must be a failure on, on who's leading the discussion. Um, another one in 2012, this is related to oncology, but I think this applies, that uh, patients didn't know that symptom management only or hospice was not was an option when their treatments were brought up. And then when that was mandatorily brought up with certain patients about it, patients, the patients took that as an option because they didn't know that it was an option before. And I think that's some of it what comes up with dialysis. People talk about, well, your GFR is eight, your potassium is getting higher, and we would need to start you and when we can book for a fistula. And there doesn't come that second component. There's that component of like, or we can conservatively manage this. We can make sure that you're comfortable. We can we see these other things. They're just better, pretty much told dialysis, and then there's an open-ended or what? Uh, what else? Um, there's a fear of abandonment if they choose. So what happens if I I choose not to do dialysis? What happens to me? And it's not irrational. I think this is this is dying away a bit, but it was not uncommon in the '60s. People talked about a lot that after they were told that there wasn't a cure or treatment, their, their treatment teams, well, the specialists would say, I don't have anything more to offer you. And the primary care teams would be like, well, you're too complex for me. And they sort of got abandoned by the system. So 
there still is, a, I think, a little bit of a fear out there about, well, well who is going to take care of me or, or what happens to um, somebody if I just choose not to continue the therapy. Um, so, you know, where, what does all, this all mean? Um, from a systems basis, a little bit outside of palliative, but just to give you an idea of what goes on in the renal world, if you're going to see these patients, you know, it's an earlier recognition of the, of the patient who may need dialysis to sort of intervene and, and, and change their trajectory a bit. Um, cost involved, so this is not sustainable, um, and I have a little slide about that later. And then the idea of just conservative symptom management. So how can we apply palliative? So if you're looking at, at it, these are you know different um, calculators to give a patient an idea of how well they'll do. The the Stoke, I, I'm always tempted to say stroke, but Stoke comorbidity scale, um, e-prognosis, which is on the UCSF website, Charleston. And then the Charleston index will also not only give you a one-year estimate, but a, a five-year estimate of, of how a patient is doing. Um, CKM web, website.com, website for uh, patients, professionals, kidney supportive care.org, and the Renal Physicians Association, they actually have a lot of, of, of data on this. The Renal Physicians Association is about 30% clinical, 70% how to, to manage your practice better. But they do have a lot of things on here about well, what, what things are more um, cost effective if you are going to provide supportive care. Um, so, you know, one thing is to discuss shared decision making, advanced care planning. Um, our crew knows this, but again, I put this in case somebody pulled this slide pack off of YouTube and wanted to have a broader understanding. But as we all know, studies show that patients don't find it's depressing to do advanced care planning. You're not going to go in and ruin their day if you say you want to discuss it in general. Um, discuss who they want to be their power of surrogate, um, their DNR status. Um, they, it's only a matter of time for all nephrologists before they have someone that, that codes on the dialysis machine or strokes on the dialysis machine. Um, courts have said that dialysis is considered a life-sustaining measure. So if an advanced directive says they want no life-sustaining measures, you can put dialysis under that heading. Um, looking at patients' frailty, how well they'll do, quality of life assessment, there's the ESAS-R or the IPOS renal and then um, a palliative care consult of symptom burden or considering hospice. Or you can even say there's a recognition that there aren't enough palliative care docs out there, but ASN and, and, and RPA both say everybody that's going on dialysis should have a palliative care consult, period. Um, goals of care, again, this slide, just to skim through it real quick, we all know this. Again, this was for somebody who was looking at this de novo, but discussing goals of care separate from discussing prognosis or bad news. How do they want to live? Um, should be framed in terms of the individual and having personal goals. Um, kidney supportive care. So 91% of the patients who discussed foregoing or ceasing dialysis um, stated they wished for family to be present. Um, it's a good opportunity to discuss who would be the power of attorney. And, and um, I also found this. It's a good idea. If, I've mentioned this in one other um, conference before that sometimes the family just don't have an idea of how sick their loved one in, and then a sort of discussion about, no, they, they have a significant illness, um, and then it, it requires uh, um, planning around that. Um, you know, and as we all know, if something suddenly comes out of the blue to a family, that it puts the family at a higher risk of complicated grief. So I think it's also a nice introduction to the family about what the level of illness for someone is if the family participates. Triggers for discussion. These are a little bit more renal specific, but I said, you know, we, we know we can use these in anything. Age, dementia, albumin of less than 3.5, peripheral vascular disease. You've got to have vascular access to do hemodialysis. A new life limiting illness. And I've, I'm not recommending that this is a guideline, but I've had patients that um, have had a significant cancer diagnosis and they say they'd rather stop dialysis um, or not do dialysis and, and pass away in that manner than to get advanced cancer. And that's a personal decision, but um, it is uh, something that you should discuss with patients about whether they want to continue on the trajectory for pre-dialysis or if they're on dialysis. Um, mental incapacity, um, patients who are in a long-term care facility usually do not do well on dialysis. Um, they can't cooperate well with the procedure. And then their comorbidities. And this is interesting, I thought. I mean, I don't know if if you would count stena or a stool softener as one of the 10 per se, but the patients on over 10 medications, we know that they do poorly on dialysis. So if they have a long list or requiring a lot of things, that's in what another discussion about well, how well we, we think you're going to do on it. Um, so this is a paradox of the trial. So you've probably seen going around that they'll say, well, maybe I'll start dialysis and see how I do. And they say, yeah, we can see how you do. 
But then they find that like um, the, the discussions, um, they never say how long the trial is or what the parameter is. And the patient sort of says, um, oh, well, they'll come and tell me when the trial's a failure, even though I'm not feeling well. And the nephrologist will say, well, the patient hasn't mentioned anything, so they just go through. So it's not that the idea of the trial is, is, is um, not encouraged, but it's the idea that when it's set up, it should be the parameters. Like in three months, I will ask you how you are feeling. Or if you, your average daily, if you're not feeling well, or at any time, if you want to, you can say, I don't feel well doing this house this morning. I don't want to do it. And that, and that is, that is perfectly fine to end the trial. Um, but again, when these things were discussed, there were no stop dates or goals or what makes a trial a success or a failure. So if it's going to be discussed, um, it's good to make sure that there's a few concrete points that everybody knows they're on the same page. Another thing is, is that some patients have um, residual renal function that is just enough to keep them going um, for a little while or helps the quality of life for a little while. But when people start dialysis, that last little bit of residual renal function may get wiped away. There's the idea that the kidneys get underperfused. There's debate about what causes it. But we do know that sometimes if somebody starts on dialysis, the residual renal function that they have goes away. Um, and then so discussing the trial, they're, oh, you go on a trial, but then their residual renal function goes away. Now they want to stop. Well, you might have actually taken away a couple of extra months or a few extra months they would have had if they'd been on, on supportive care um, alone. Okay, so what are the stats? So for a patient on dialysis, the mean average life expectancy for someone on chronic dialysis, this is applicable to somebody that was started on dialysis like in the ICU and they're still in the ICU, but for chronic dialysis, the mean average life expectancy is about 7.4 days if they stop, median six. Um, seven is quoted all over the place, so I just say the right answer. I don't have anything to do with writing palliative board questions and I'm not going through, but if you have to take an estimate that they say, oh, you're talking to somebody and they want to stop dialysis and what's the average amount of time they expect to live, um, it's, it's seven days. Um, another one found that, um, you know, 79% um, had passed away before 10, 10 days and less than 5% made it to 30. Um, one, longest in that study was 40. There's another study where somebody made it out to 100, but I think, but they were way, way the outlier. For most, the idea of between one to two weeks is a safe estimate. Um, doing doing um, the best care that you know a safe estimate to tell somebody about what happens if they if they stop dialysis. Everything gets worse as you age. So one started study found that <clears throat> patients start at age 75, <clears throat> 80% of them won't live six months on dialysis. So it's the same life expectancy that if they just went on, on hospice instead, well, maybe not the same life expectancy, but the same term expectation um, uh, uh, if they went on hospice. So they're not extending their life maybe that much, much longer. And some patients may actually do better. Again, that idea that you just may have removed their residual renal function. Um, the elder population tends to live longer with lower residual function as compared to our young people that somehow ended up there. Um, another study found 75 was a bad time to initiate 40% mortality. And then the Dutch had a study that said there was no survival advantage over conservative measures for a patient greater than 80 years. Um, to be started on dialysis. Um, other studies, just again, just to hammer home the stats for older folks, um, half a patient 75 or older um, would pass away um, within a year. Half of those patients was in six months. Um, uh, a lot of the highest mortality were those who had started inpatient or ICU. And um, said that a good chunk of these patients were started when already hospitalized for something. And I thought this is an interesting note about this. It said, the study found that many of the patients felt they had no choice, so they weren't given a choice. Nobody discussed supportive care or other, other things to start dialysis. And then once they'd been started, many regretted doing so. So I thought that was an interesting thing about how, how much is actually discussed with the patient before they started in, uh, inpatient on dialysis. 23% um, of patients who start dialysis, uh, hemodial senperitoneal will end up declining to continue. So withdrawing from dialysis is the third most common cause of death in ESKD. So heart disease or cardiovascular disease, number one, infectious disease, number two. But just saying, I don't want to go on anymore um, is, is for almost a quarter of the patients is the re reason that they pass away. But yet there still uh, continues to be system-wide a very poor system about, okay, you're saying you don't want to continue on this anymore. What is the pathway to get you to hospice? Who would recommend? Have you had an informational? Have you, have you at this point done your, um, uh, who's going to be your surrogate decision maker. 
Um, and then the percentage of people withdrawing has increased. That's probably reflective that it was so hard to get on dialysis before. The patients were probably otherwise pretty sturdy and willing. And now, unfortunately, we keep we're doing dialysis as a default for patients. Um, let's say so. Excuse me one second. I'm just going to take a, a break to have something to drink real quick. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the mean survival of somebody um, what's the mean survival of somebody. Um, uh, uh, it does not start to dialysis, how they go. It could be from six to 20, 24 months. Um, but the patients were more likely during that time to not spend their remaining time in the hospital. Um, there's going to be more of these patients on the way. So what I say to, to people and what I, bo I bore, bore the fellow here at Sparrow to death with, um, he's probably shaking right now watching this talk. But, um, you know, there's going to be more patients on the way. There's a theory that those patients who would have died before due to heart disease, they're surviving to kidney failure. So the stent and and some of the other advanced disease, advanced um, cardiology procedures we have, when they would have been done away with by the, the heart attack or something like that, um, they've pa they've been able to go on. And then they've lived to the point that they their CKD catches up to them and they go to dialysis. Um, pediatric patients with problems making it to adulthood. The, we talk about the new wave of NICU survivors. Um, that uh, kids they don't well, as soon as they're born. And again, my my fellow is that he's done a NICU fellowship would say about this that their renal mass is going to be what it's going to be if they're born for you know 32, 33 weeks um, and going. And that's the idea now that uh, we're having the first people living to 20 or 30 who are that age. Um, and we don't know what exactly is the normal for them, but we see what starting to see waves of hypertension in people that are about 30. It's like, well, I don't know why you have, have hypertension. You don't have any risk factor to go through. And then you find out that they were a 30 week preemie or, or, or 31 week or something like that. Um, and they probably do not have the, the same renal mass or, or development as a theory. And just to give you, you know, an idea of um, how far the, the NICU science events, I always find this is fascinating. Um, that John F. Kennedy's uh, had a child that passed away. He was born prematurely, and and they did everything they could. But they they just said, oh well, they did what they could with the technology in 1961. But he passed. He was a 33 weeker, um, and at that point, it was considered like cross your fingers and hopefully they would make it. But they didn't. And now, not to to, to underestimate, but um, being 33 weeks does not send a a, a a panic shiver down most NICU doctors. Um, uh, you know, you talk, start talking about 25, 26, 27 weeks, but 33 weeks, or as a, as a friend of mine who's, who does NICU in San Diego, it says it's, it's sort of a chip shot. Um, and it just only 50 some years ago, it was pretty much the equivalent of, 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 uh, of, of, of a life limiting illness that they knew they, the, the child wasn't going to make it. Um, so now we have this wave of, of people who are probably going to have, um, renal disease sooner. Um, and then, of course, the increasing rates of diabetes and, and obesity, we're going to see more renal patients. Um, so just throwing this in and the idea, we all know this. Again, this is somebody if they wanted to pull this presentation off and have a better idea about integrating palliative care in early during the course of and then hopefully instituting hospice care sooner when it's more appropriate. And of course, pr providing bereavement. Um, symptom scale. So there's the ERSR, 13 symptoms, and it could be filled out. A majority of it can be done by a caretaker. Um, the IPOS renal, I like I like this one because it also asks about caregiver stress. And then, of course, what we all have, you know, there are other pain scales, pain, depression, anxiety, things that should be considered in these patients. Um, so symptoms familiar to nephrologists. So there are symptoms that the patients have that the nephrologists address will hopefully help, like blood pressure, anemia, acidosis, but other symptoms, fatigue, itching, you know, a field un, 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 unto itself. Um, side effects of medication, nausea, insomnia, pain. So all these things to be addressed uh, here. Depression, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more, but depression is under, under treated. And, and the idea is that the nephrologists will say, well, yeah, they're probably depressed. Like, well, of course they're depressed. They have a chronic illness and they just sort of leave it. It's like, well, don't, yeah, they have a chronic illness. We understand the reason, but do you, you know, do you want to help them with that? Do you want to see if there's something they want to do for that? So it just sort of got put aside. It's like, oh, well, it's part and parcel with being um, an advanced kidney patient. Um, so again, we know this, just saying that um, palliative care does not speed you or hasten um, someone passing. Uh, again, the numbers and the utilization, um, we do. Okay. 
Um, you know, primary palliative care can be applied for CKD and um, ESKD patients, um, recommended by RPA, ASN, HPM, and then patients um, actually do better, live longer than starting on dialysis. Um, the financial implications, how it's going to impact our actions, the need for improvement, um, and the need for research into common symptoms experience. And then this is actually just um, saying this, this is the NKF of the National Kidney Foundation saying um, we can't let kidney disease bankrupt Medicare, which is where we're sort of going if we don't rein this in. So um, where I think it's going, so um, gosh, I think I might have pulled up, um, oops, excuse me. If, if um, the effect of dialysis bundling. Um, uh, so there's an experiment with dialysis in um, uh uh, the early 2000s, and nephrology as a field chafed at it, and they said, well, you're only going to get a certain amount of money for each dialysis patient, and that amount of money you have to use to manage things. You just can't order everything you want want um, for them whenever you want it, so you're going to have to figure out how to be more efficient with it, and, and of course, they always say it's a reasonable amount of money. And at first they chafed, and then the field sort of 10 years later had to sort of admit that the powers that be were sort of right, that um, there was too much use of, of, of um, erythropoietin stimulating agents. Um, they weren't actually doing iron. That was one of the great, they didn't need uh, an e EPO, they needed iron um, for their anemia. Um, there was changes in packaging and dosing, so the, the instead of paying for 40 cc's of a medicine and then 20 cc's was thrown out every time they they packaged it a little bit more better use for dialysis sessions um uh, development of new treatment medications and algorithms you know other other protocols to do um and what they found at the end of it is like gosh the, the people that put these limits on were actually right um so now they're starting to look more at um symptom management and and conservative supportive care and I think combined with that statement from the NKF, um, there's going to be a lot more emphasis about conservative management for patients with end-stage kidney disease. Um, uh, you know, looking at goals, um, 2018. I think I might have brought. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, jump off real quick. I think this was my protocol shell, and then I added a few more slides, and I'm. If I can't find it real quick, I won't hold anybody hostage. But um, so while you're uh, looking for that change, I just want to make a couple of comments that I think are really important in terms of just emphasizing uh, for. Uh, uh, you know, for for our, our, our crowd here, when, when Medicare approved this payment structure in the '70s, um, it's not just for Medicare beneficiaries. I hope everybody understands that it's for anybody. And there were no guardrails that were really put around that. If 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 any doc said, "I think that this patient needs dialysis," they got dialysis still do, and um, and Medicare pays for it. So if we wonder why it occupies such a high percentage of our healthcare costs. It's because there's a lot of indiscriminate use, uh, and when when you talk about you know our we have um, uh, with 25 percent uh, mortality in the first year, and I think the Italians I thought said it was one in nine, or maybe it's Japanese, something like Correct. that. Um, that um, that uh, I think that they use it's much more discriminating in terms of who actually will benefit from this rather than just saying. Well, let's throw it, you know, it's what they, what they talk about, throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, you know, we'll just give it to everybody and it'll work for some and won't work for others. But, hey, we've given everybody a shot at it without having that conversation, as you noted, uh, how important the shared, the shared decision making and, and, and the reality of what this involves. And that it converted from not for profit to for profit because of the fact that there were few guardrails on that. And because there was money to be made, and I think that that's uh, that, that's sort of there are some perverse incentives here that are that are challenging the system. I, I might be a little bit overboard, but that's that's my my cynical observation. 
No, I, I would agree with you a hundred percent on that, and 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 to say that there's there's cost. And I even have a little slide about that. I apologize. I, I was telling Dr. Mulder that m the computer that I'm used to took a header last week when I had to hit the brakes. Um, this is a new computer, and getting used to which files are where on my PowerPoint. So I apologize. I just have a few more slides, and then I'll I'll end your misery. It's not a James Fletcher presentation unless I have one technical issue. Um, but just to say, so things for the boards for palliative um, pain, advanced CKD dialysis, so the first line agents, listed, second line hydrocodone, but the ones to avoid morphine coding, that usually comes up as a softball on people's boards. It, it, it sort of feels like, it's like, do you want to give a patient Tylenol, a, a dialysis patient Tylenol threes for pain for something? No, tramadol is avoidant. Um, and then some people, you will, see that when some people say there's absolutely no residual function and that's what we worry about with the NSAIDs um, hurting that say okay well, you might as well have Motrin again because the the thing that you're worried about is gone anyway so you may not want to jump on someone completely if they prescribe Motrin for a patient who's on dialysis because they may not have anything um, to lose but that's pinions also vary on on topical NSAIDs how much they're absorbed or do they affect anything I think it's the the needle is swung back to they don't affect um, they don't affect renal function Neuropathic pain, gabapentin or pregabalin, um, of course, attention in the renal patient. Um, uh, they have about the same efficacy in studies, but gabapentin is usually prescribed because it's cheaper. Um, but it has other benefits. So uh, renal pruritus, poor sleep, restless leg syndrome. So you might get more bang for the buck by prescribing, especially if they have one of these other symptoms. Um, carbamazepine, actually, it's been shown that like it helps. And then nobody's really addressing or going back to, to look into this, but it seems to do have a good profile managing these symptoms and it's actually easier to dose than a renal patient, but it just hasn't sort of been able to sort of um, come to the forefront. Tricyclics, they're not contraindicated, but the side effect profile, it tends to be. So in other words, if you're on tri you have renal disease and you're on a tricyclic, you're more likely to have side effects and the, and the side effects are more likely to be severe. Um, and of course, many renal patients have cardiac issues as well. Um, pruritus, so it's under asked by nephrologists, even though it's a very common symptom. Um, one benefit of transplant, it'll, it clears away renal pride as if people are trying to make it to there. Um, what gets forgotten is that uh, patients with dialysis usually have dry skin or other things of skin that just an emollient would help. So a, 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 a topical skin um, uh, emollient or moisturizer is sometimes all they need. Uh, topical analgesics like primoxine can, can work, oral antihistamines. So the, the rule of thumb with the oral antihistamines, they may or may not not help, but if they haven't helped within a week, they're not going to. So it's it's uh, don't put somebody on a on a diphenhydramine as a fire and forget and ask them in three months if it's doing any good. If, if they can't tell you it made a difference in a week, it's probably not going to. Um, we mentioned gabapentin and pregabalin. Um, Sertraline, a little bit more about that later. Uh, the new kid on the block is something called diphenhydramine, and I've heard three different pronunciations. So if that's not the way it's done, out Western Michigan, I apologize, um, but uh, it's so new, um, but it's given with dialysis. So it's something that can be suggested to the nephrologist, but it has to be part of the dialysis infusion to affect. Um, and then some people question whether if they're having itching, whether it's a de facto marker for dialysis ad adequacy. So you get in a little bit debate about if a patient's telling you that they're having itching, do you sort of have to tell the nephrologist to step it up a notch with looking at the numbers of what you're doing? But um, I know just as many that would just say, no, it's an unfortunate thing. Some people get it. Some people don't. It has nothing to do with their dialysis prescription. Uh, GI-related symptoms in the um, ESKD patient or dialysis patient. Um, appetite. Ginger, that's actually in the GI community. And they actually have a few small studies that show that ginger does help. It's considered to both lower the nausea threshold maybe centrally, but it's also a mild propulsion. It's sort of like a um, uh, an herbal ray gland. But for gastroparesis, and um, they've actually found that ginger does help. They prescribe that um, for patients as a as, um, <coughs> another uh, tool in the in the toolbox for that. Um, small meals um, are they constipated? We all know in our field about how constipation can set anything back. Um, ask them sm um, avoid smells triggers social cues. Eat what you want to eat. Spice spice. Drink. So this is a good thing I I, I saw in a presentation from Dr. King. And just get different cooks. So it's just if somebody likes French onion soup, just see if it helps them. But it's their favorite. But give them variations as compared to Aunt Millie's uh, French onion soup, as compared to the French onion soup down from the steakhouse. Um, but sometimes doing the, something that they like 
but different people doing it sort of adds in if they're finding that they're, they're liking less and less things in general. Um, dry mouth, um, oral hygiene. So um, a big crusade uh, from a colleague of mine who's married to a dentist is how many patients go to dialysis and they don't see a dentist. Just I guess it might be a reflection of our population, but it's so important to, to cut down one of the sources of infection in this group. Um, colder foods, frozen foods or pops, um, mouth rinse, artificial saliva, and then um, if they feel like they're getting bitter or unpleasant, some dialysis patients report they start getting metallic tastes with things and the idea of just spices or flavorings to explore um, what sort of helps cover up that taste. Uh, depression, so SSRIs are the most studied. Again, um, a lot of nephrologists, but this tends to be leaning down more to the, the older nephrologists, the, the, the words getting out, um, just think it's part and parcel of being chronically ill. And they say, oh, they probably are depressed. Well, of course they are. They, they're on dialysis and they don't try to address it more. Um, I haven't ever seen why, but sertraline tends to get the most attention. I don't know if they backed the studies or it was just some person who does a lot of research. It's their favorite SSRI, but it's thought to work very well um, um, for pruritus. Um, it, it also is getting indicated a little bit more for um, um, irritable bowel syndrome, just resetting serotonin. Um, we try to avoid citalopram and acetotalopram. Um, they've been noted to have cardiac issues in people with advanced renal disease. And there's so many SSRIs out there. Why would you choose these two otherwise um, from that, especially since sertraline has been studied a lot and does not seem to have that risk. Um, most antidepressants are not cleared that, that by dialysis to a significant amount. Um, Tricyclics, are, again, we just talked about that again. They're, they, they work well, but you're going to have a higher um, side effect burden. Um, exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy, and again, it's just not addressed. So in 2018, this whole thing of, of, with nephrology, the, the idea of the dialysis bundle, like you will do these things to become more cost effective. 2018, you have to show with your dialysis patients, you've screened them yearly for, for depression to be able to meet your, your goals to be paid. Um, so the indications to start dialysis, the GFR less than 20, start thinking about it. Um, increasing the transplant workup, talking about getting a dialysis access, the, the fistula first program. You usually don't start if the, if the GFR is greater than 15. Five to 15, you try and, and get them to go along. Um, in some conditions, have a different cutoff. Diabetics tend to get started a little bit sooner. And then if it's less than five, you almost always start, regardless of how the patient's feeling. Um, and then uh, uh, one of the things is, for reasons we don't know, and this is changing a little bit, but for reasons we don't know, the longer you can get someone to, to hold off before they start dialysis, the longer they tend to do. So in other words, if, if you start dialysis in January, then you may have five years from that January because now you start in January. But if you started them in March, you get five years from March. And it's like, oh, well, if you started them on dialysis sooner, wouldn't they feel better or do better? And, and the longer it's like, actually, they don't. We don't understand why. But if you can get them to go two, three, four months Without going on dial, without going on dialysis, you've bought them two, three, four months. Um, so I understand that that's getting changed a little bit, but that's still a good rule of thumb. That's the reason why to see these patients frequently, but see if you can get them to go to go along a few months before um, this. And then what Dr. Mulder was was going to um, just to say the indications to start dialysis. Rough, you could put one of these, but a acid base ingestion. But down here, this joke. Sometimes you know A E I O U A E I O U, and sometimes why why because we can bill for it. Um, and there is a study that showed that um, private practice nephrologists start dialysis more frequently and with a higher GFR than their counterparts in the federal system. Um, the people in private practice say, oh, the federal system, they're just salary workers, they don't care. But the people in the federal system says, well, we're not paid to start dialysis, we're paid to treat the patient. And that's why, but the outcomes were, the, were actually the same or a little better in the federal system for holding off. Okay, just real quick, couple of single points here. I know I don't have the expertise with ketamine that, that you guys have. I'm sure I'll probably have to learn in the future, but we just don't have it quite set up here in Lansing. But it seems to be going up the charts for treatment of neuropathic pain in CKD patients. Um, if you're ordering anything for these patients, don't order a phosphorus-based enema. Uh, that phosphorus load and then going straight in their system can knock out whatever their um, residual renal function is or can even damage um, CKD that, that, that's, that's not that severe, um, the big bolus. So 
Um, if you're providing en enemas for any opioid-induced constipation CKD, make sure it's not a phosphorus-based one. That was my colleague Frank Hurst was the one who did the original paper on that from Walter Reed. Um, starting dialysis does not always remove symptoms. So that's one of the big things in having the discussions with patients that, oh, well, we'll start you and your itching will go away or you'll feel better or your energy return. Uh, not so. Some people get started on dialysis and it just doesn't improve their function that much. That That's a promise of what they'll get when they start. Sometimes it's not adequately screened depression, but I also think some people are just very ill and, and their CKD is just only one of their problems. Um, fatigue, timing your events around dialysis days, that might be the benefit of home dialysis. So home dialysis now is sort of recognized better as, as for a lot of reasons people do better. The idea, instead of going to a, a center three times a week, you have this massive procedure, sucks all your fluid out, puts it all back in in three hours or four hours, um, and then you've got to hold on two or three days for the next one. Well, home dialysis is usually on average about five times a week, and um, you're not going between sessions as long, so you're only building up toxins a little bit less, and then it pulls it off, but it's not having to pull it off as hard. So it's more gradual, it's more gentle, and patients say that, that they feel better on it, but then also um, uh, patients do better on it as far as their numbers and parameters and, and things, and it's cheaper. So I think you'll start seeing that there's going to be a bigger and bigger push, I think, for, for getting patients to be set up at home to do their dialysis. Um, exercise as well. They can do a depression, restless leg, and sleep. And went through this and this. My summary slides. Yeah, I think we're there. Those, those were just a few of the important slides I, I, I put in my last uh, minute. Um, quality metrics. Um, and again, um, uh, one of the metrics they're trying to put in, some of my, some of our other colleagues um, want to have it that in the next set of dialysis guidelines that come out, that um, you need to show for your dialysis patient that you've done advanced directives and that every year that's been updated. You ask every year who their surrogate is and, and, and things like that if you want to be able to bill for your dialysis. Okay, so that's it. Sorry for my glitch, but that's how you know it's me. And uh, if there are, are any questions, um, I'd be I'd be glad to to listen. Uh, thanks, James. Whoops. Hang on a second. I unmuted the wrong thing. Sorry about that. Oh no, no worries. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I was that's always been perplexing to me, and I'm asking if there was a resource for this. It will be easily accessible. I think that we do a pretty good job of identifying those drugs, number one, that can potentially potentiate a kidney injury, and also those that need to be modified in dose because of the presence of the What I have a, a very, very poor handle on, and quite frankly, I, I'm not necessarily convinced that all nephrologists either, is what is the impact of dialysis on certain drugs? In other words, what drugs should we not even bother giving because they're going to be dialyzed out or that we have to time to give after dialysis or those that are okay to give anytime because they're not impacted by dialysis. Is, is there a resource somewhere that, that, that could help us in that particular uh, metric? I'm not, I'm not aware of a particular Bible, so to speak, or, or resource manual or the, or, the, or the big guideline for that and something that's necessary. Um, my understanding cynically is that the drug companies have not found that there's a benefit to them to research it that much um, as to compare to give rough guidelines. Um, to give you an example of how it complicates things, and you're saying that uh, as well, um, people can't figure out why CRRT doesn't have a better survival benefit. It should. And then someone's proposed it like, well, at least in septic patients, you may be sucking away all their antibiotics. And um, that's why you don't see you, it's it's not showing a survival benefit in that group as you're sucking away all the medicines that they need. So I'm not aware of a, of a of, of such a thing, but I'll, I I should look into that a little bit more little bit more in case something's come along. But th there's nothing on my desk that I have that's that's more the sort of the renal guideline how to dose. Yeah, my sort of um, relative to the CRT issue is uh, is a little bit more naive. These are much thicker patients. That are in, you know, are in the ICU. So I would not expect their survival uh, to be uh, uh, to be you know, you know I would expect it to be worse simply because of the complexity and multiplicity of uh, issues that are going on. So I will um, 
I'll stop talking here in a second and see what other questions uh, our uh, audience might have out there. Go ahead. I was wondering about um, what your opinion on Cymbalta was for people who might have depression with also with the, with the pain component. I know it's usually not recommended, but do you ever use it in reduced doses? I, I've used it in redu reduced doses um, in these patients, unless they tell me that they have poor gastric function. Um, all Cymbalta, to my understanding, is controlled release. And if they don't push things through well, I've found that they don't, they don't tend to send, get the bang for the buck um, uh, for that, like they having the functional equivalent of a bypass. But I will use it in that group. And I, and I do think it, 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 it has fantastic uh, double barrel effect for depression and pain. Um, so. Um, the federal spending was alarming, like 1%. So do, are you aware of any legislation underway uh, which is like uh, going to fix this, for example, preventive medicine? Um, is there anything like incentivizing uh, the whole process? Like if someone goes to the primary care regularly, get the blood test, follow all the rules and everything, is this this process can be incentivized? Like, for example, our employers are incentivizing if we are getting exercise or we are getting added money to our paycheck. I, well, we can do? I, well, incentivizing, they're trying to, I think, the, the people that write about why do our dialysis patients do poorly as compared to Europe is that Europe, everybody has access to a primary care provider if they if they want them a little bit easier. I think it's a shortage of primary care. And I think they're hopefully incentivizing primary care and to screen for this, I think is what they're hoping to do and add, and add, add screening. Um, that slide that I showed that I said my colleague um, uh, he did, you know, did me the favor, and, and and he always requested that when I do a talk like this, I just put a plug in for for where he does research. If you think of the average salary, so ninety thousand dollars a year is the cost of dialysis, and if you get somebody set up to see a dietitian to help them eat, um, I'm I'm not roughly sure, but I'm, I'm sure dietitians, for the sake of argument, let's say they make twice that. I I don't know, but but even if they made one hundred eighty thousand a year, if they saw two patients and they stop two patients from going on dialysis for a year, then they've saved the system the equivalent of their salary. So, you know, his thing is that as soon as you start recognizing it, that the, the, and he's looking at incentivization, people should be able to have easier access to um, dietary support and dietary discretion. And that's what that was, uh, or, or, um, uh, information. And that's one of the incentives that he works on uh, to go through. The other incentive is um, there is an incentive going through about vascular access, about people recognizing it um, uh, sooner, getting them in, because people do better and it's cheaper for the system in the long run if they get a fistula or a graft placed instead of working with a catheter. And even part of that incentive program is the idea that if you think somebody's going to be a renal patient, don't put in a subclavian line, because if that subclavian line messes up that vessel, you've lost that entire limb for dialysis access. So if you got to put, put in an IJ or an EJ or a femoral, but if you know that they're looking at dialysis in the next couple of years, try to avoid a subclavian. And that was actually at the very top of the list of things, of information they wanted to get out there about getting them evaluated sooner for transplant and vascular access. But um, I, I think the it's going to be on the on the flip side. Preventive care is there, but I think there's also going to be a push just to come up to somebody who's 82, and and instead of saying, "Well, we'll do a trial," just say, "You know what? You're what this what we sort of know is that you're not going to do any better on this, and you're more likely to spend time in the hospital than at home if we start you on dialysis." Great talk, okay. uh, a ton of wonderful information there. And I was in, in, in addition, uh, not in this chat, but I've been getting texts about oh. uh, about this. So w well done, James. Oh, thank you. I Sorry, I, I if anybody asked a question in the chat, I'm sorry, I, I was scrolling through, but if anybody wants to correspond with me, I'm james.fletcher at sparrow.org. I'd be happy for any questions. So thank you for the, the offer to speak. Thank you.